you focus on the breath, you're creating a home base for the mind, a home base for your actions. This is the place where you want to take your stance, being with the breath all the way in, all the way out, being the, with the direct sensation of how it feels to breathe. Learning to relate to that in a way that feels comfortable, supportive, energizing, or relaxing as need may arise. But the important thing is to get a sense of familiarity here, that this is where you belong. And this is your primary focus in your meditation. And John Lee says it's like your, your home base. He goes, we hired down the home for the mind. Then the mind has its places to go foraging. He calls it Gocharadama. The different topics you need to bring up, say when lust arises, anger arises, laziness, discouragement. And it's good to have those tools ready at hand. That's why we have the contemplation of the body for lust. Developing the Brahma Viharas to guard against anger and ill will. Contemplation of death to overcome laziness. And recollection of the Buddha, the Dhamma, and the Sangha to give us encouragement on the path. There's also recollection of our generosity and our virtue. to reinforce our sense of self-worth. These are places for the mind to forage, to go when it needs a particular antidote to a particular problem. But you can't wait until the problem comes up to start practicing these things. You've got to practice them ahead of time. It's like keeping your tools in good shape. When the need arises, you pull out the saw and it's already sharpened. You pull out your knife and it's already sharpened. Whatever the tool, it's ready for use when you need it. This involves two things. One, having these, these other topics at hand and learning how to read the situation so you know what's needed at any particular time. This relates to seven qualities of the Buddha. So, so those of a person of integrity. The first two deal with words, having a sense of the Dharma, having a sense of its meaning. In other words, educating yourself as to what the Buddha actually taught and what it meant in the context of his teachings. Anyone can pick this up by reading or by listening. And by thinking about the matter. And then by putting it into practice. It's not just the reading that allows you to know the Dharma, or the listening, or the thinking. But it's a good beginning. You read about mindfulness, and then you have to put it into practice to see well, exactly what does mindfulness mean? How does it function? You read about right effort. You put that into practice. See what it means. But this is where these other five qualities for the person of integrity come into come into play. Because so with these different topics of meditation and the different qualities you need to bring to the mind at any one time. Mindfulness may be useful at all times. The ability to keep something in mind. But what is it you're going to keep in mind? In the mind, and you keep in mind what you've heard of the Dharma and heard of its meaning. But you have to keep in mind the necessity to learn how to read yourself. And that comes, or that develops, only with practice. That's why one of the, the third qualities is basically that, just getting a sense of yourself, 
This can apply both inside and outside. Looking at the mind, learning how to read the mind, what does it need right now? Which direction is it inclined? Towards greed or towards anger? Is this energy level too scattered or is it too low? How do you bring it back into balance? That's the internal level. The outs outer level, you look at yourself as you interact with other people. What is your position with regard to them? What are your strengths and weaknesses? How do you learn how to compensate for your weaknesses? How do you learn how to use your strengths to extend that strength to other areas where you're not quite so strong? This is something you have to learn from experience. You can learn it only by being observant. And the same goes with the other qualities. A sense of enough. Again, this applies inside and out. How much practice with the breath is enough? How much? When do you need to develop your powers of goodwill? How much is enough there? How much walking meditation is enough? How much sitting meditation is enough? How much food is enough? How much is too much? How much is too little? Again, this extends inward and outward. And having a sense of time and place, kala nirta is the Pali term. When's the right time to apply a particular teaching? Here in the West we tend to have an absolutist attitude. Take one teaching and just run with it without learning the nuances. I mean, the basic principles are all very simple. You want to do what's skillful and want to avoid what's unskillful. And in some cases it's pretty clear across the board, but in other cases it's more subtle. Because there are times when it seems the different teachings conflict. On the one hand, you want to clearly recognize what's skillful and unskillful. At the same time, you have to learn how to bear goodwill to everybody, regardless of whether they're skillful or not, regardless of whether you like them or not, and learn how not to confuse what you like from what's skillful and what you dislike from what's unskillful, both in your own behavior and other people's behavior. You have to learn how to tease this out and figure out what's the right time to apply what teaching. What's the right, and then on the external level, what's the right time to talk? What's the right time to remain silent? When it's appropriate to say certain things, when it's not appropriate. You can learn this only by trial and error and being very observant, both of your own behavior and of the behavior of others. And then finally, to the more exclusively social skills. One is a sense of the society you're in. In other words, the group of people you're staying with. What kind of speech is appropriate in a particular group of people based on their, their class, their background, the circumstances you find yourself in? What groups of people is it best to remain silent in, and what groups of people is it best to speak? And what kind of speech do you use? What do you say? This is an important part of the practice. You can't just go in and say, well, I'm the kind of person who says X all the time. Well, you can't be that person and be a sensitive Dharma practitioner. You have to develop a range of skills and a range of ways that you use your speech. And then finally, there's a sense of judging people, not in terms of their ultimate worth, but looking at the people around you and seeing who's a good example for what kind of behavior.
there's a bad example for what kind of behavior. And then you look around, turn around and look at your own behavior. What can you learn from these people? It's interesting, there's a lot of talk on how we should not be judgmental of other people or pass judgment on others. And it's aimed just at that, this quality of being judgmental, looking at somebody and immediately forming an opinion. But the Buddha has a lot to say on how to judge other people, primarily as examples for your own behavior. Who's a good example? Who's a bad example? And what are good standards for judging? You don't judge people by their, their status even though you have to be sensitive to their status when you're talking to them, but in terms of their value, their worth, it has more to do with the skillfulness of their intentions. How do you read that? And you find that with over time you can begin to read people. In fact, the better you get to know your own mind, the better you get to know other people. That you see the different workings in your mind. You realize that this goes on with other people as well. This is an important principle in the practice, learning how to generalize in this way. It helps develop a sense of some way about the world. Because sometimes we think, well, I'd like to have that social position, and I'd like to have this security, and I'd like to have things this way. But then you look at people who are, have things that way, and you have to remember they have the same types of suffering that you do. And you begin to wonder, is it really worth having that particular kind of ambition? In another way, it's also useful to re recollect that when you're sitting down to meditate and things are not going well, that you don't just give up, say, well, I must, I must not have it in me to meditate. Everybody faces difficulties. And it's good to reflect on that, good to remind yourself of that so you don't get discouraged. The proper question is, okay, if I'm having this problem, other people have had this problem before and they've solved it. How would they solve it? It must be solvable, because otherwise we wouldn't have enlightened people. And when you have that confidence that these problems can be solved, that's important. So learning how to use your powers of judgment wisely, skillfully, that's an important part of the practice. And it comes with experience. It comes through trial and error and learn, and being alert to the fact you've got to be sensitive to these dimensions of the practice. That's important, because otherwise we come in with our preconceived notions, whether they're educated or not educated. As I say, up in the wilderness of Alaska, the people who tend to do most poorly. They try to move into the wilderness are the ones who come with a lot of preconceived notions. They've read up all the books on surviving in the wilderness, and they've come up with particular ideas, which may or may not work. But if they just hold to those ideas without testing them and being without, without willing to grow and develop, and see where some ideas, how far some ideas hold and where they no longer hold, if you don't have that ability to see the nuances and the subtleties, you're not going to survive. And it's the same with the practice. You may know the Dharma, you may have understood its meaning, you've read all the, the books on the topic, listened to all the great Dharma talks. But it's in the practice that you learn the subtleties and the ins and outs. Such your knowledge is not just two of these qualities. You want to have knowledge in all seven. You know the Dharma and its meaning. You have a sense of yourself, a sense of enough, a sense of the time and place, a sense of the people you're with, and a sense of how to judge people wisely. So realize that the Dharma is not just a matter of getting a few instructions and then following to the letter. You also have to learn how to read yourself, read the situation around you, and realize that you've got a lot of different tools to, to draw on. 
You've got to keep your tools sharp, and you have to have a clear sense of which tool is right for which situation. It's only then that your practice becomes all around. <laughs>